Good evening and welcome. Uh, welcome tonight to a theological engagement on disability brought to you by the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America and the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. We are so grateful that you are here and it was so uh, cool just a moment ago to watch uh, so many of you kind of being uh, arriving as it were virtually as the, as, um, as the chat opened up and as our evening um, began. My name is JD Flynn. I am the editor of Catholic News Agency. I'm a friend of the IHE and the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. And, um, and that friendship began with my own family. I'm the father of two children with Down syndrome. And I am also a very big admirer of our speaker tonight, Archbishop Joseph Kurtz, who is an advocate, a friend, and a shepherd to people with disabilities all across this country. Tonight's lecture and our conversation are really a continuation of the um, 2019 symposium put on by the National Catholic Partnership on Disability and the Institute for Human Ecology, which was called Recognizing the Body of Christ, a Theological Engagement on Disability. And I know that a lot of you who are participating right now in this, uh, in this evening were, were there with us last year and, uh, and know that that was really just a, a wonderful opportunity to be together and to reflect on um, the body of Christ, especially the body of Christ in the body of those who are disabled. And I hope that we can continue that conversation uh, tonight. Before we get started, let me mention to you that if you would like to see closed captioning, you can uh, look just down at the bottom screen of the bottom bar of your screen and you'll see a little button that says closed caption. And if you press that button, you'll have closed captioning. So that is available to us, we're grateful for that service. And as you can see, um, uh, ASL inter interpretation is available for us as well. So we're so grateful for our interpreters. Um, before we move into our lecture, let me just tell you a little bit about our, our sponsors and our hosts. The Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America exists to educate university students to quote, give the Republic her best citizens, to sponsor multidisciplinary academic research on the intersection of human flourishing and Catholic social doctrine, and to organize events like this one that encourage conversation between the academy and the public square. The National Catholic Partnership on Disability works collaboratively to ensure meaningful participation of persons with disabilities in the church and in society from a perspective uh, of faith. And um, we're so grateful to the Institute and the National Catholic Partnership on Disability for bringing us together tonight to hear from and to talk with Archbishop Kurtz. Tonight's event will include a reflection from Archbishop Kurtz and then a conversation um, into which we invite you to participate. So you'll see down at the bottom on that same bottom bar with the closed caption button, uh, a, little, a little box that says Q and A. And if at any point uh, during Archbishop Kurtz's comments, you have a question or a thought, you're welcome to put it into that box. And, uh, and then Archbishop Kurtz, Dr. Miguel Romero, who's known to many of you, and I will have kind of a conversation bringing your questions um, into engagement with Archbishop Kurtz after his remarks. Before that, though, um, I, I just uh, like to, um, are, we're really hosted in, in a certain way by the Catholic University of America. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Deacon Stephen Kanib, who's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Catholic University of America. Deacon Stephen was ordained in 2017, and he lives in Exeter, New Hampshire. As a member himself of the disability community, Deacon Steve witnesses Christ's presence in a manner similar to St. Paul. After St. Paul prayed to have a thorn removed, we find, of course, that when weakened, we become strengthened by God's grace. So Deacon, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, and welcome everybody on behalf of the Catholic University of America. It's my privilege and honor to uh, welcome you to uh, this year's program. Last year was the first year I took part physically in the uh, symposium. And it was a great pleasure to welcome uh, ourselves. I was there with my wife, Andrea, and son, Phil. We felt immediately connected to the community and saw firsthand this wonderful mission of the Catholic Church of the United States and this special ministry, 40 years in, that we are uh, now formally part of it. And so I uh, relish the idea of, of uh, as a board member, representing Catholic University and welcoming virtually you to the campus. Um, I, I've lived a, a privileged life, um, really uh, ignorant of much of the disability community until 25 years ago when our uh, second oldest child, Philip, uh, had a mysterious seizure in the middle of the night. 
And after a long process, we finally identified this as a rare form of epilepsy that is uh, quite unusual and results very often in a, uh, a very significant regression in cognitive ability to the point where he uh, at one point was not able to get up off the floor. Thankfully, he recovered physically and is thriving uh, emotionally, but uh, intellectually still remains uh, well behind in his years, probably somewhere in the uh, three-year-old uh, level. What we didn't have any idea about is how this would introduce us to a deeper relationship with Christ, especially through Phil. And uh, it is a connection we feel with everybody that's part of this community. We'll feel sorry for the people who don't understand it. Bishop Kurtz's talk tonight is one near and dear to our heart on just how present Jesus is in every one of us, especially when we're most vulnerable. This past seven months during the pandemic, we've experienced uh, a new normal, just like everybody else. Difficult to adjust to, but has its own beauty. The bubble in our apartment, it's now our home, is, uh, is Andrea, me, and Phil. And rather than Phil going to day program five days a week, he's with us. We are his day program. And uh, our outdoor activity is once a day a walk. Um, I, I see the significance of all the people's lives associated with NCPD and was reminded very deeply of that. Uh, a week ago, New England lost a very uh, heroic hockey player named Travis Roy. Travis was a, a standout hockey player recruited by Boston University and only 11 seconds into his playing time was paralyzed from the neck down. He was 20 years old, spent the next 25 years as an inspirational speaker, foundation founder, and went on to be one of the most revered sports figures in all of New England. Travis finally died a week ago, but he left behind a legacy that cannot be replicated. And it's one that is so dear to the heart of everybody who encountered him. Another significant uh, oh, come on. Part, of, part of this journey has been to witness my wife's dedication to a hearing loss endeavor that she has to basically put together an online handbook for people who experience hearing loss as she and many members of her family have called Gathering Sound. It should be available to the public in the near future and will open one more door. These captions and the ASL that are featured today are near and dear to our hearts. So a warm welcome from Catholic University Thank you, everybody, for what you're doing here, and we look forward to a wonderful evening together. Deacon, thank you so much for sharing your story, and thank you so much for uh, representing Catholic University of America to us and, uh, and for a witness of, of the, the love of your own family. Uh, just again, I would remind you before I introduce our our speaker, um, uh, two things uh, that um, uh, if you have questions or thoughts or comments during Archbishop Kurtz's comments, you can click on the Q&A box down on the bottom bar of uh, your Zoom window and enter those questions or comments or thoughts there and uh, we'll be able to see them and then introduce them in a conversation that we will have uh, after, the, uh, after Archbishop Kurtz's remarks. Um, before that moderated conversation, we'll be very blessed because we'll have um, a, a short response to Archbishop uh, Kurtz's remarks from Dr. Miguel Romero, who is known to many of you. Dr. Romero is a professor of religious and theological studies at Salve Regina University, an NCPD board member, um, and uh, also 
uh, someone who has spoken beautifully and poignantly and written beautifully and poignantly about uh, his own experience uh, with disabilities and especially the experience of knowing and loving his, his disabled brother. And in fact, I think that's uh, something that we'll hear a little bit about from Archbishop Kurtz as well. If you don't know Archbishop Joseph Kurtz, um, you'll be glad to have heard from him tonight. Uh, Archbishop Kurtz, who's the Archbishop of Louisville, is the Episcopal moderator of the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. He has been the Archbishop of Louisville since 2007. Before that, he was Bishop of Knoxville, Tennessee. And in 2017, Archbishop Kurtz gave the National Catholic Educational Association's Exceptional Learners Conference keynote address entitled Learning With and From My Brother George, Born with Down Syndrome. And Archbishop Kurtz has spoken uh, many times since then and probably before then about his life and love with his brother George, who ha ha was born with Down Syndrome. Archbishop Kurtz has more than 30 years of experience working in social services within the church, including a position as executive director of the Catholic Social Agency and Family Life Bureau in the Diocese of Allentown. He has been um, vice president and president of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. He is uh, currently on the board of the National Catholic Bioethics Center, the Institute for Priestly Formation, and a member of the board of trustees of the Catholic University of America. And more important than all of those things, he's an all-around good guy, and I think you're really <laughs> going to like him. So, Archbishop Kurtz, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you. Uh, JD, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I'm not used to being in this little box in the corner of my screen, so I just want to make sure, am I being heard by everybody? JD, just give me a, a, a yes or a no on that. We can hear you, Archbishop. Perfect, perfect. Well, then, uh, let me begin, if I can. Uh, Deacon uh, Stephen, thank you for your welcome, but also for your witness. I appreciate that very much. Now, I'm going to give a, a presentation and some reflections, really to talk more about Christian anthropology and some of the priorities that are part of Christian anthropology. I'll be using, of course, the experience with my brother George. Uh, you may have questions that are unique to the crisis we're in, the pandemic crisis, and I'll be eager to, to hear them and try to respond to them as I can. You, you know what Christian anthropology is. You know that uh, each of us made unique is made in the image and likeness of God. You know that we are created by God and God sustains every breath we take. We're meant for eternity. Uh, in many, many ways, and I go to St. John Paul II's uh, book on mystery and gift, that's what we are. We are both a mystery and a gift, and that's every person that we're talking about today. Now, I'm going to talk about the experience of mystery and most especially how I have encountered that experience in my life with my brother, George. Georgie uh, actually died. He almost was 61 years old. He was 60 years old, and he died in 2000, January of 2002. And so uh, it's now 18 years, a little more than that, that he died. Uh, I'll be speaking from that experience, and every one of you who's online will be able to also perhaps speak uh, very beautifully from your own experience, as Deacon Stephen did. Um, about three months ago, I was known, it was more than that, gosh, the pandemic is so long, almost a year ago, believe it or not, uh, I was uh, giving confirmation uh, at a parish, and a grandmother came up and said, uh, Archbishop, uh, my little two-year-old daughter has a question for you. Oh, I said, sure. So the daughter was there, and I said, what, what's the question? And she said, uh, Archbishop, why was my brother born with autism? And I said, you know, you and I, when we get to heaven, God willing, are going to have a lot of questions to ask, because this is part of the mystery that I can't really answer. However, let me ask you a question. Do you love your brother? And she said, well, I sure do. And I said, I can tell you this much. Your life will be infinitely enriched because of your love for your brother 
and your brother's life will be infinitely enriched because of your love for him. Um, and that gift and mystery perhaps is more central to life than any classroom or, or any job that you end up taking on. Uh, it was the principle, of what we might call of being, as opposed to doing and having. I think it was Soren Kierkegaard who in the 1800s, the philosopher, Danish philosopher, he said, life is not so much a problem to be solved as a mystery to be lived. And others have, have quoted that. That notion that Pope Francis talks about so often of walking with or accompanying someone has us move away from seeing disability or for that reason, any challenge in life as simply a problem to be solved. But rather we enter into what we might call a mystery to be lived. Now that doesn't mean that people uh, with a certain disability do not do things. Um, I remember that it was in 2004, St. John Paul II in giving a conference said this, and I, I, I'm gonna read this quote to you. He said, for disabled people, as for any other human being, it is not important that they do what others do, but that they do what is truly good for them, increasingly making the most of their talents and responding faithfully to their own human and supernatural vocation. So it's, it's doing, but it's not a priority of doing. I'll give you two little anecdotes from the life of my brother, George. Uh, uh, they both uh, capture this notion of eulogy virtues. You probably have heard that distinction between resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Uh, David Brooks in his book, Road to Character, has kind of made them somewhat known. Uh, resume virtues, things that kind of promote ourselves. Um, eulogy virtues, as he said, that are lasting and that we carry with us into eternity. Well, let me give you two examples. Uh, Georgie and my mother died in September of uh, 1989. And shortly after the funeral, my brother George came to live in the rectory where I was a pastor back in Pennsylvania. And we ended up living together in two rectories and in a bishop's house for uh, almost 12 years. And in that process, my brother gave more to me and taught me more about humanity than I could ever imagine. I did an article for uh, Catholic Digest, and gosh, it's now, it was done in 1990, so it's now 30 years old. Um, and in it, I told a story about after morning mass, I must have looked a little dis discouraged or down. And my brother Georgie came, put his arm around me, and he said, don't worry, mom is in heaven, you have me. Now that's a lesson from a theologian. Do not be afraid. Eternal life is the gift that all of us yearn for. And I have my brother Georgie, mutual accompaniment. I'll tell you another one. And I wrote this recently about uh, something with the pandemic. It was called the Saturday morning and the pandemic. And it was about when George first came to the rectory Saturday morning, the staff were not usually there, but I had my list of things to do. I'm kind of a, an, an A-driven personality. So before Georgie even got out of bed, I started to list, George, here's some things we got to do this morning. Got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. At the end of my list, he simply turned to me, looked in my eyes, and he said, good morning, reminding me that there is much more than lists of things to be doing. There is the encounter with the person. And that's something he did after that say, I need my coffee. So that was also part of that. This is why the revised guidelines for the reception of sacraments uh, by persons with disability that was passed by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, I guess two years ago, it emphasized not the disability, but rather the gift and the gift of baptism mystery and gift. There's a second item that I'd like to say, and that is that if you treat somebody with dignity, there's no place for paternalism. There's no place for looking down on someone. 
when I was growing up, I used to resent the fact, even with people with a sweet voice, would be kind of condescending. They'd, they'd say to me, oh, your brother Georgie must be so nice and so good. And I'd say to them, yeah, some days, and I'm good too some days. But we're human beings and we are unique. It was again, Soren Kierkegaard, who said now 150 years ago, once you label me, you negate me. Once you label me, you negate me. In other words, if you want to treat somebody with dignity, Christian anthropology says, treat them as equals. Treat them as someone who deserved respect. Here's what the US Bishop said in 1978 on the uh, statement on people with disabilities. And it was right after that, that the National Catholic uh, Partners in Disability was formed. But uh, number 33 says this, People with disabilities are not looking for pity. They are seeking to serve the community and they enjoy their full baptismal rights as members of the church. They enjoy their full baptismal rights as members of the church. Another aspect that I'd like to mention to you for your reflection is what I would call a private priority of lingering with someone rather than seeking a quick solution. Some of you know that last year I had a bout with cancer and because of it I had to get all kinds of chemotherapy and immunotherapy and it gave me almost like a little sabbatical and I, I wrote a reflection about a year ago that uh, actually is going to appear uh, in uh, the Collegeville Give Us This Day, that, that booklet that, that guides people on prayer and reflection each, each day of the calendar year. And uh, it, it's entitled All This Time. You remember the story from Luke 2 of the visitation. You remember that our blessed mother, already pregnant and carrying Jesus himself in her womb, traveled and visited her cousin Elizabeth, who was also pregnant with, as you know, John the Baptist. And when I first went into the seminary, I thought, you know, that's a model of serving other people. And it is, by the way. But as I learned more theology, I realized that the mystery of the visitation is more than just serving another person. It's also encountering and sharing joy. Pope Francis's uh, first encyclical, as you recall, Evangelii Gaudium, talks about the joy of the gospel. Even in the scene in, in Luke 2, it said, and the child in the womb of Elizabeth leapt for joy. So those two things I've been carrying with me now for over oh, 50 years. Um, but then last year, I noticed something that I had never seen for 50 plus years. And that was the last line in that event. It said, and Mary stayed with her cousin Elizabeth for three months. She lingered with her. And perhaps if we want to truly understand the mystery of Christian anthropology, we have to come to understand what it means to enter into someone's life. I worry that sometimes parish uh, programs uh, concerning disability become kind of a quick checklist. Let's, uh, let's make sure things are accessible. Let's make sure we have various programs and projects, all of which, by the way, are necessary and true. But it's the quick solution that we should be uh, very cautious of. Because when all is said and done, if you want to understand the mystery of the human person, and especially the mystery of someone who was born or has a, a disability, we need to linger with that person to spend time with that person. And that's a, a great, great um, lesson uh, for me and, and perhaps for yourself. I wanna mention one other, other thing and that is the priority of being with rather than being in isolation. I learned in my involvement with the National Catholic Partners in Disability that the word belong is much better than the word include. I didn't know that at first. And I thought, well, I like including people. But I realized from the meetings that I was going to 
that when you include someone, it presumes that's a person who's been excluded. So there's already a category. When you belong, we are all on equal footing. We all desire to belong. And so I've been using that anytime I could. Uh, the uh, theologian R Romano Guardini, a very fine theologian, I just read a, a, a book on his life. He talked about the difference between contradictions and opposites. He said, contradictions like good and evil will never live together. But he said, opposites, look like they're not the same, but they live in healthy tension. He mentioned in liturgy, a silence in the liturgy and active participation in prayers. We need both of them and there's a healthy tension between both. Well, he was a friend of Martin Buber. And some of you know the philosopher Martin Buber who uh, basically uh, is known for the I and thou approach. That in other words, I need others to become myself. It's just not a nice thing that I do to reach out to others. I actually need others. I'm a social being. I've been, um, I just talked to our priest today here in Louisville. And one of the things I said is I hate the fact that we talk about social distancing. I, I like physical distancing. We got to keep people safe, but it's physical distancing. It's keeping six feet apart. It's not social distancing, we're social beings. We need to be connected and engaged with one another. We need each other. Um, my last point before the conclusion, we do need what have been called mediating social structures. You know that uh, the sociologist Peter Berger and Richard Newhouse back in the 70s talked about mediating social structures. And they said between an individual and between society, there needs to be some ways of buffering, the primary one being, of course, the family, that the family is so important. Well, I've come to see that persons with disability welcome and need mediating structures. We have for many, many years, a monthly program here in Louisville called the Faith Club, in which both caregivers and uh, people who are themselves with a disability come together. They come together for prayer, mostly for enjoyment, and they're a great support to one another. Um, the only thing I would say about these structures is one, we need to make them available, and two, they need to be freely chosen. Not every program and not every structure that we present to someone with a disability will be appropriate for that person. And we need to admit that and to know that listening is going to be very much a part of what we say. Um, let me mention a word about lingering with caregivers. I was impressed by what uh, Deacon Stephen said at the beginning of his uh, presentation, welcoming us with Catholic U. And when he, he spoke about it, he, he spoke about the change that occurred in his life. And I think like me with my brother, George, I think most people would say, gosh, the change was really great. That doesn't mean that there's not a special burden that caregivers experience. I think, thank God for my mom and dad. They were just so, heroic and good with my brother George. And we were the first ones to say, George is a gift, not a problem. Uh, but I wanna say a word of gratitude for our support of people who are caregivers and, and to linger with them a little bit. Um, the Latin word sacrificium doesn't mean burden. It means to make holy. Uh, yes, there is a burden anytime we take responsibility for another person. That's not a bad thing. But it's a path to holiness for us and for the person whom we accompany. And so this is a gift of mutual accompaniment. That little girl said to me, uh, Archbishop, why was my brother born with autism? And I said to her, I don't have an answer. But you and I, when we get to heaven, are going to ask and try to find out what about this mystery of life? But 
do you love your brother? She said, I sure do. And I said, you will be enriched and changed magnificently because of your brother's presence in your life and you will be a big change for him. Thank you for this chance to share these reflections. Thank you so much, Archbishop. Um, Dr. Romero, now I, I think that you'll offer a few uh, words of reflection and a few uh, response to, to Archbishop's uh, remarks. Is that right? Yes, yeah. Thank you, JD. So uh, there, was, there was an element missing at the end of uh, the Archbishop's talk. I was expecting uproarious applause and uh, <laughs> And it didn't happen, and I wished it would have happened because it, 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 this, these are these are beautiful pictures, beautiful images, and um, breathtaking connections that, that you made for us, Archbishop. The things that stuck out to me, uh, uh, words and phrases, pictures that, that you gave us, um, uh, under the heading recognizing each member of the body of Christ, uh, of the body of Christ uh, in a time of crisis. Under that heading, uh, the lines and the pictures that stuck out to me was the element of uh, 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 persons with disabilities, uh, ordinary folks who experience impairment, illness, and injury. This is not a problem to be solved, but a gift to be received. And this is not just the case of um, uh, persons who happen to have an impairment, illness, or injury. This is every human being. It's a, they are a gift to be received. And when you, when you spoke about your brother, Georgie, your brother, uh, you, he, he taught you a lot about life. He taught you a lot about humanity. Uh, you learned through him and through your time with him what it meant to encounter another human being, to be connected to other human beings. He gave you a picture of mystery and gift, insight into the mystery of the human being and the gift of the human being. You also spoke about the, uh, the unique gifts and the dignity that every person brings with, uh, as members of the body of Christ. But you highlighted in particular the words of of uh, uh, the, the words of the, of the US uh, bishops in 1978, that people with disabilities are not looking for pity, but they seek to serve in a community, to be part of the community. You also emphasize the role of lingering, the role of, of, of spending time, of entering into someone's life, of spending time waiting and being patient with someone's life. Uh, you also emphasized the need for others, the priority of being instead of including. Uh, that we become more ourselves when we spend time with others, that we need each other to become who we are, and that as we accompany one another and walk with one another, that something, we discover something, we encounter the mystery, we discover the mystery, and, and we're able to receive the gift in a new way. And he also talked about social structures, uh, the, the, the structure of the church, the organization of the church, and how, uh, how these things can unfold organically within the life, uh, the ordinary li life of the body of Christ. Here's what sticks out to me about that. So I'm a theologian, and uh, when I hear a bishop bring up these kinds of questions, frame the matter in, in this kind of way, one of the first things that came to mind to me, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a small little line from Veritatis Splendor. Uh, I, had it, I pulled it up for a second, and now I just lost it, but here it is again. Uh, this is from Veritatis Splendor, uh, paragraph 109. Um, this is what Pope... Saint Pope St. John Paul II write, writes, by its very nature and procedures, authentic theology can flourish and develop only through a committed and responsible participation in and belonging to the church as a community of faith. Hmm. By its very nature and procedures, authentic theology can only flourish and develop only through a committed and responsible participation in and belonging to the church as a community of faith. What does that tell me as a, as a scholar? What does, it, what does that say to me as a theologian who aspires, who aims, who intends to do uh, my work uh, uh, from the heart of the church and in communion with the church? Well, I hear your words and I hear what you're saying about uh, not a problem to be solved, but a gift to be received. Uh, about the things that can be learned and discovered in relationship with your brother through the encounter 
with other, other folks, spending time, the emphasis of lingering, of entering into someone's life, of being patient and listening, the need to be with each other, becoming more ourselves when we spend time with those who uh, are not different from us for the sake of difference, but are just part of our body, part of our community, part of the communion that the Lord has brought together. What strikes me about what you've presented, Archbishop, is it is a it is a somewhat intimidating theological challenge. Uh, the heart that I took away from this message is the way we do theology changes. The way one thinks, speaks, and argues theologically, it changes when it's informed by the church. Not an ideal, not, a, uh, not, not an ideal, not some sort of caricature, and not just one part of the church, but the full, living, ordinary, clumsy, messy body that's because this is who we are. Authentic theology can flourish and develop only through a committed and responsible participation in and belonging to the church as a community of faith. That makes me think about some other things. It makes me think about certain ways that uh, theologians, Catholic theologians, might sometimes have a tendency to avoid lingering, to avoid being patient, to avoid the clumsiness and the inconveniences and the challenges and the oddness of certain parts and certain members of the body of Christ. Not out of spite, not out of anger, not out of frustration, but simply because it's not my specialty. It's not the thing that I do. You know, this, 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 this is not where my interests are. And I wonder, I wonder how does that impact the way a theologian goes about her or his work? In what way would the faithfulness of her or his work be impacted if they're not lingering, if they're not waiting, if they're not walking, if they're not attending to the fullness and receiving and participating in the fullness of the body of Christ. I can imagine that there would be errors, that there could be mistakes. I, I, I can imagine that there would, might be confusions. I can imagine that there might be results or, or, or conclusions that are inconsistent with the gift that we've received. That worries me and, 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 and it's something that, that, um, that concerns me uh, because all of us are frail, all of us are broken, all of us, uh, we can't do everything, but still there's something there to be received and, and there's, it, it calls for a particular kind of work. That, that, that was the main thing. Those are the big things that stuck out to me, Archbishop. So. Um, so here, here, here's my question. Um, uh, you gave us a constellation of pictures. You gave us a, 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 a pictures that were not only stories, but also striking images and striking formulations. Um, when it comes to the work of theology, uh, to recognize each member of the body of Christ, um, uh, are you worried or are you concerned about the places where theologians uh, don't linger? aren't patient, aren't open, for whatever reason. Uh, does that worry you? Does that concern you? And what do you think the implications are when theologians uh, don't do that kind of work or aren't given the, kind of the, the opportunity for those kinds of encounters in their theological uh, and moral formation as scholars? Miguel, thank you so very much. Uh, uh, have I opened up the thing properly? Can you all hear me? Yeah, Good. I can see. Uh, you know, I, 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 there was an old story that used to be told, uh, and I won't go into the whole thing about bowling, but the conclusion was error increases with distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you've, you've put your finger on something very important, and that is the theologian who is not immersed in the life of the church. In other words, to be a theologian, one must follow Christ and one must follow Christ in his body. And so we never script, this is the way to do that. In fact, I would say uh, the average person who's a theologian already has in his or her midst, plenty of opportunities to linger. The question is whether the connection is being made. And so uh, I, I would agree with you. And, and I would worry uh, that we would end up being, if, if pushed to a, a limit, what we might call an ivory tower. 
someone who is immersed in the world of ideas, but not engaged in the life of the church. And I, and I think the theologians that I have followed and, and have found uh, to be especially helpful are, are ones who are self-reflective. They are able to look at their own lives and, uh, and, and, and live. And I think the last three popes that we have uh, would be a good example of that. Archbishop, thank you so much for that answer, and I would echo Miguel's call that there that that there ought to have been uh, the thunderous applause that we so often miss in these Zoom remarks because it was a beautiful, beautiful talk, right? Um, well, thanks, yeah, thank thanks, you. Katie. Some of the questions that we're starting to get from our participants, um, there are a few themes emerging, but one of them is just um, uh, sort of how to begin in a parish and in a diocese when um, when there's there's a, let alone a sense of belonging, sometimes not even sort of that sense of of, of inclusion with intentionality, sort of how, how to begin when a, when, a, when a parish or a diocese doesn't have a history of, of being attentive to these things in the way that you described being attentive to in your own diocese. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think you have to begin with the word befriend. Mm -hmm. How do you befriend someone? And I know that, uh, that there's a direct relationship between what I bring to my holy hour in prayer and the people that I have befriended that day. I don't think you have to run out and try to find new people. God's already placed people in our lives. Uh, I was a pastor in two different parishes and in both cases, I had plenty of opportunities to listen and to be engaged in the life of people. So I think it's, it's a question of the priority that I give. And as I said in my talk, I worry a little bit that the effort of the church with disabilities will be reduced to a checklist with yeah. programs. I did this, I did that. I don't mean we shouldn't have checklists because you do need to look and see how you're meeting standards. I mean that, that when we come to prayer, there should be something yeah. deeper than that, that prayer list. And part of it is to say, how am I changing? Yeah. What's happening to me? People who are uh, priests who, who go on communion calls. I can think back to when I would go on communion calls and often visit people who were shut-ins. There was such a richness yeah. that you were entering into the lives of people. So I, I, I would say uh, if someone's beginning is begin by listening and begin by listening in prayer, bringing the people's intentions in prayer. Yeah. You know, we've done a, a fair amount of work in in, in um, special ed in Catholic schools, which, as you know, is a, is a place where many Catholic schools would like to be for much further along than they are. And what we found is that the things that are sustained are the things that begin that begin with a relationship rather than beginning with a structure that the parish yeah. wants to help, you know, wants to build something for um, these kids that the, who, who they know and uh, and these kids who are part of the community and these kids who are particular who, who are particular and from that grow oftentimes universals that are become applicable to more and more kids and you bring in a special ed coordinator and you realize how many kids weren't being served in the school um, but it but it does I think the priority of relationship and the priority of uh, of, of knowledge of, of a disabled person as a, uh, first as a person in friendship makes makes all of the difference in, in yeah the, in I think about 10 years ago 11 years ago there was a wonderful couple here in Louisville who had had big family but they had a child with Down syndrome and because of it the result of it is what's now called Immaculata Classical Academy. Mm -hmm. About 25, 20% of the kids, and there's 200 some kids, 212 kids, I think, in the school, and, and about 25% have some level of disability. Yeah. And so it's mainstreamed. It was, but it, it took people to kind of make room for that couple who said, we want to do something for our child but we also want to gather other people around. And so I, I think if you're a priest or if you're a parish leader, rather than impose an idea, look first at the landscape of your parish and see who, is, who are already there that I can help walk with and learn from. That's right. You, you know, there's a point that's been made by some of the participants in the comments about um, ling lingering beginning in the interior life and in, in the life of prayer that um, in, in as much as we linger in contemplation, we're, we're all the better positioned to linger in relationship with other people. One or two yeah, and, uh, of course, now you're, 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 you know, I'm a social worker. So, so, you know, I'm going to talk about the reciprocal nature because mm -hmm. I think um, uh, 
I think my, my, my efforts to reach out to people and the frustrations have brought me to my knees more than anything. And so uh, I think there's a reciprocal nature. It's not as if I, I think, well, for the first half of my life, I'll pray. And then for the second half of my life, I'll do something. I, I think one begets the other. And so uh, I, I would say the person who, who talked about that is absolutely right. We need to cultivate uh, I think that that life of lingering, but we also have to be careful that it's not a comfortable life that makes us remote. I've heard people, young priests accused, well, I can't do something because they have to get their holy hour. Well, uh, in, in, in many ways, um, we need our holy hour, but we also, the priority here is where am I going to find Jesus this day? And so I think there's a reciprocal relationship between our time in prayer and our time in engaging people in service of others. Yeah. Miguel, turn your microphone on. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so I, I have a bishop, I'm sorry, I have a bishop. I, I have a question along along the lines of, of, um, of what you all are navigating in, in, that, in that exchange. Uh, what was being described is, is, is uh, an approach to ministry, an, an approach to engagement, um, and how these things originate and develop or organically within the life of, of, of an ordinary parish community. Um, but then, so, so I think about that in relationship to, to our sponsor, right? Uh, I, IHE. And this is, this is part of what JD, uh, uh, JD read, read at the beginning. The, uh, the Institute for Human Ecology exists to educate university students to give the Republic the best citizens to sponsor multidisciplinary academic research on the intersection between human flourishing Catholic social doctrine to organize events encouraging conversation between the academy and the public square. So I think about okay, we have these parish ministries that are being developed. We have folks who are living responsive to uh, to the call of to the call of, to discipleship, Christ's call. Um, and but we also need to think well about that, right? Uh, we we need to think about these uh, um, uh, about not only how to do it well, but when we are when we are faithful, what are the what are the implications for this, uh, for the church, for for the for the academy for training, um, uh, not just theologians, but scholars, academics, uh, 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 Catholics, uh, 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 training Catholics to make the very best contribution to, to provide the best kind of moral witness uh, to uh, to the world, <laughs> and that. Is a challenge. So I'm wondering, Archbishop, how do you see that connection, yeah. the connection between uh, uh, the development of mis ministry and thinking about uh, uh, the response, the responses to particular needs, and then the work of the academy, the work, the work of, of an institution like the Catholic University of America or Salve Regina University, where our intent and our goal is is to form and shape uh, the. Uh, not only the intellect, but all the, the moral lives uh, to form the lives of students. How do you see that fitting? Yeah. To let, me, let me mention something that I think uh, might indirectly address that. And that is the notion that there's, there's two elements uh, whenever someone is involved in service. One is the element of actually serving. The other is the theological reflection on what we did. And I think that's also true for people who, where a child is born into a family that, like my mom and dad, they weren't prepared to, to receive my brother George. So they needed someone to assist them in, in interpreting, if you would, the experience that they had. They began with a love that perdured for 60 years, but, but they, they needed that engagement. And I would say that a theologian um, also needs that part. In other words, the, the theologian who says, well, I think I have enough background that I can give a, a theological reflection to what is happening here. Uh, that's not going to have much credibility or witness unless that person himself or herself enters into some work. I'm, I mean, I'm it's not the same thing, but I'm thinking of Bart's notion that, uh, that I get up in the morning with the Bible and the newspaper in my hand. In other words, that there's, there's this notion that, um, that a theologian worth his medal is, is not just 
reflecting on, on his study and scholarship, but actually is engaged in the life of those students that he's trying to form, is learning in a sense from the students and their experience. And in the same way, uh, I'll use my mom and dad. My mom and dad, if somebody visited and helped them, the parish priest, that, that priest presence is helping them interpret the realities that are confusing for them. And so I think that's where I think mutual accompaniment is so important. And I think there's no reason that that's not the case with uh, people in the academic or theological world. They, they need also not only to accompany others, but to be accompanied. That's right. Hmm. There, are, there are great questions being asked about that by our participants, Archbishop, and one of them goes um, from the academy to the seminary. Uh, uh, one, one participant noted, you know, that there are a lot of priests who, who she's encountered who don't have much experience with people with disabilities, which stands to reason, and, and asked if there are initiatives being made or how, how the church can better uh, give seminarians preparation to engage in friendship and pastoral ministry with the disabled. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, the short answer to that is uh, back in the 60s, which would be the cave age when I went through the seminary, uh, there, there, in the first one I went through, there was no uh, pastoral or the, uh, uh, apostolic work. We didn't go out of the seminary at all. So we're in a much better position now. But uh, after reflecting a little bit, seminary is important, don't get me wrong. But once a priest is ordained, the people, the priests that become his model and his hero shape more than anything else his life. There's many who said we need to go back to that model where, where the person seeking a vocation lived in a rectory and, and learned by firsthand experience. I'm not ready to, to, uh, to promote that. Uh, however, I think that, that um, like anything else, we're not going to have a finished product when someone is ordained. We often uh, say, you know, you get the priest you deserve. What they mean by that is that uh, you as a parish community shape the life of the priest. And so it, that's where the mutual accompaniment comes. And, um, and I think, yes, in the seminary, but I think it would be naive to, to think that uh, the person getting ordained is a finished product. Uh, it, no, the same way as it would be naive to think that a married couple, once they, they finish their marriage preparation and start on life, are a finished product. Obviously, right, right. we know, you, you all probably know that better than I do, but, um, but I think that's, that's part of it. And I think the answer I would say is to the person answering, answer, and asking that question, how can you assist? How can you befriend a priest in your parish and invite him to come uh, to your home? Doesn't have to even be for a meal, but to have some social contact because some guys, priests, they have no experience. They they often, if it's a if it's a a foreign situation, they need assistance to help. So I, I would just say that, uh, yes, seminary is going to have to do work, and I think there, there is formation uh, in pastoral ministry, but I think the real work happens when we get into the parish and roll up our sleeves. Our, uh, our daughter, our daughter Pia is uh, nine and ha has Down syndrome, as is our son Max. And we had a priest at the breakfast table the other day. And just by, you know, just by habit and, and, and uh, you know, his ordinary way of doing things after we all sat down and everyone had coffee and food, he started to bless the food. And, uh, and Pia stood up and she said, stop. Pia prays and she started the grace because for Pia, starting grace is the most important thing. And I think there, it was there very, it is. Now you yeah, have to finish right. that story. You have to finish that story. How did the priest receive that? Well, he, he, you know, he was, he was a young guy and I think he was, this is a new thing for him, but he, he laughed and, and, and we explained, you know, Pia starts grace and then we all pray and he was perfectly exactly. okay with it. So it's exactly. good. Right? Yeah. Exactly. That's right. he, uh, yeah. You introduced the priest to what we call the domestic church. <laughs> right, that's right, and and P is the uh, P is the liturgical MC of our domestic exactly. church. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's Archbishop Curse. So I, I I'm wondering if you would comment on uh, part of the subtitle of, uh, of 
tonight's gathering. So, so recognizing each member of the body of Christ, Christ uh, in a time of crisis. So the crisis, right? Um, uh, we have crises coming out of our ears uh, these days, um, but but one of them is the coronavirus. Like this, we were supposed to be in person tonight. Uh, that was the plan. Uh, yawn nine months ago was that we would be we'd be gathering together in person. We'd be having a conversation of this sort. Um, but then there you'd be embodied and physical and um so we're performing or in enga engaging one another uh in in, in what's, what feels like a little bit of an awkward way as fun as, as it is and as smooth as it, as it is we probably have a better turnout um, but i can you comment on this moment in relationship to the themes and the concerns that you sure. brought to attention this evening sure sure the, the two things that i would say first of all i did answer it because I said that uh, a crisis is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be lived. Mm -hmm. And when I go to morning prayer and I have my list of the five things that I have to solve in the archdiocese today, mm -hmm. at the end of that prayer, I find, wow, I may not be the one that has to solve this issue. So the lingering, is perhaps the most valuable thing for us to do now. I, I talked with our priest today about the two challenges, the challenge of isolation, and it's a big challenge today. And so for a person who needs supportive services and can't get out for them, it's a, it's a double challenge, but there's also uh, the issue of creativity. And so the, our ability, I, I think this is an age in which we are gonna become more the domestic church that we're going to get better at what it means to, to learn from, from Pia and others about uh, the way in which uh, we pray at home. Um, but I, I would say we have to resist the temptation that somehow uh, we're going to personally this morning solve the pandemic. Uh, that actually plays into it's a problem to be solved. Now it is that it's a, there are people who are getting vaccines, et cetera, and they are working on that. And we have responsibility for the common good to make sure we're protecting other people. So we wear masks, we sanitize. My hands are cleaner than they've been since I was two years old, uh, two, two weeks old. And, um, but by the same token, I think we have to confront the fact, well, no, wait a minute, what makes me think that I'm gonna solve every problem that I, I, I identify as a problem? L let me take a deep breath and see what opportunities uh, already are presenting themselves. And I think that's what I talked to our priests about today. Uh, the creative opportunities uh, to, to, to call some people that you can. And one of our priests said he hasn't called parishioners for years, and yet he's doing it now. So that that would be, uh, I resisted the fact of, of identifying the crisis as a specific problem to be solved. I think we have to look and see how is that hurting the flourishing that needs to take place within a family and creatively, what can we do to, to mitigate that and minimize it? Mm -hmm. I think what, what's, what's striking to me, even about the way you framed it, is uh, when it comes to the crisis, uh, this time of crisis, uh, the crisis is not the impairment, uh, the impairment to illness and injury as it happens to be present in our communities. Like that's the gift. Um, uh, we, we can receive, recognize and receive the gift of persons, uh, uh, regardless of their degree of impairment, illness, and injury. And yeah, we, we have challenges right now, um, but the problem is not the person, right? It, uh, that, that's the gift. Um, uh, uh, maybe there are uh, extra challenges surrounding uh, particular persons, but that's all of us. We all bring our own challenges. We all bring our own weaknesses and vulnerab yeah. vulnerabilities, and uh, we lack in all sorts of different ways. Um, some of us are more ignorant than others. Some of us are more clumsy than others. Some of us are more broken and wounded than others. So sometimes those wounds, the spiritual wounds are on the inside. Yeah. Uh, and those need to be attended to also. Yeah. The deeper our priorities with eulogy virtues, the more alike we are. Yeah. Yeah. The more we yeah, see seems... history in each person. 
it seems like now, I mean, in a certain way, that is, as, as you said, the, the opportunity of now in, in terms of um, the, the vulnerability that most of us have occasion to hide more frequently is more is more on the surface because of the challenge and stress of this, you know, this moment. People are struggling more and, and in a certain way there's in that struggle and in, an invitation for a more authentic solidarity with each other and, and part of that each other is people whose struggle is, is more manifest with regularity. Yeah. Somebody told me years and years ago, this was in the 1960s, they said, you are a tab. And you have to remember, I thought they were referring to that Coca-Cola product that was uh, <laughs> the original uh, diet drink. And I said, what do you mean? They said, you're temporarily able body. You're a tab. That means that as you get older, as you, you have experienced life, there will be uh, challenges to, to you. Your body will not last forever. And so let's let's locate ourselves, keep ourselves healthy, but let's locate ourselves in what's really most important in life. And I think in many ways, I think the pandemic, at least for me, has deepened my priorities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that may be a good place for us to begin to wrap up, but there have been a, a number of participants, Archbishop, who have asked about um, your own health. So perhaps you would be willing to share a little bit about, about your own health. You know what? I feel healthier than I, I have in a long time. Thank you for asking. Um, uh, I had a form of, of cancer that was a, a, a bit of a problem and it shocked me. I thought, I thought I'd never get sick. And that was last uh, uh, April a year ago. And uh, ended up having all kinds of uh, immunotherapy and chemotherapy. I had a surgery and since the surgery, the doctors at Duke Cancer Institute said to me, you know, about the best thing we can do at Thanksgiving is say that you are malignancy free. And so from Thanksgiving last year to the present, I have been malignancy free. I've been taking That's immunotherapy nice. every six weeks. I have one more uh, to go and uh, and uh, thank God, I think I'm I'm doing well. I, I think I'm getting more tired, but I think that's because I'm near 75. You know, you're supposed to get tired when you get that mm -hmm. age. But but I think I'm back. But thank you. Uh, uh, if somebody is asking whether I will receive prayers, the answer is yes. I need all the <laughs> prayers I can get. Well, thank you. Thank you for that update. And thank you for your remarks. What I take away especially is that the priority of lingering and then the belongingness that we, that we share with one another. Thank you for those points and so many others. M Miguel, if you wanna offer any additional thoughts and then Archbishop. Um, if, if, if I was to say like of, of the most important takeaways for me and uh, the most poignant reminder is uh, uh, from this talk is how important it is for uh, those who are intending to think well um, in communion with the church, whether they're theologians or uh, uh, lawyers or business persons uh, scholars, historians, uh, the, the, regardless of, of the ministry that they're performing on behalf of the church, how important it is for them to be connected to the church, um, and not just part of the body of Christ, but the fullness, the reality of the church. Um, uh, th that's important to, to thinking well, and, 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 and not only to thinking well, but also um, uh, living one's life uh, responsive to the call of Christ. Um, and, and that's hard work. Um, and, it, and it's risky and sometimes it's clumsy, but that's a gift. That's part of the beauty of the tradition we live in. It, it is embodied, it is clumsy, and it's wonderful in its clumsiness. Um, so thank you for that, Archbishop. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, and my, uh, JD, my closing remark would simply uh, be to say that uh, uh, in, in, in many ways, uh, we simply uh, need to know that uh, we need Christ in our lives. Um, Christ needs us. The church needs us to be complete. And so, uh, if anything, I hope uh, people, at least I will remember, uh, let's avoid the quick solutions. Mm -hmm. And let's look at this in a long way and think, well, at the end of my life, what will, will I be pleased with the way I treated this person? And I will, and I'll end up with that too. Every once in a while, I look back, and even in my care of my brother George, and there were times before he went into the nursing home. He was the last 10, 10 months before he died, he was in a nursing home. Uh, that last, that last uh, year, uh, I, I was impatient. 
And I often think about that. And I think, you know, we need to accept our own weakness in our efforts to, to care for other people. So uh, St. Paul said, I glory in my weakness uh, because of the grace of Christ. Thanks be to God and, and, and thank you for this evening and thank you uh, to both of you for your, your, your thoughts and reflections. It, it, it seems clear to me that uh, the, the Holy Spirit has been moving uh, through you tonight. So thanks be to God for that. And thank you all of you for participating. Um, my closing remarks would be really just to thank all of you for participating and a few uh, notes for you. In the chat, you'll find more resources uh, from uh, the Institute for Human Ecology and the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. Uh, if you want to uh, learn more about um, aspects of what was discussed tonight, you can find uh, videos and, and other resources uh, in the chat. You, you can also find an opportunity to, uh, to financially support the work of the Institute for Human Ecology and the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. And, um, and as a, uh, not only as an attendee, but as a donor myself, I would encourage you to, uh, to, to, to do that if you're, if you're able to, and, uh, and also to follow the Institute for Human Ecology, and the National Catholic Partnership on, uh, for Disability on social media, if you're able to, and you can find resources for all of that in the chat. So thank you all for participating. And um, Archbishop, perhaps you might close us with a prayer and with your blessing. Absolutely, let's, let's ask God's blessings upon us as Thanksgiving approaches. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, you are the giver of all gifts. We ask you to make us conscious of the gifts that you've given us, the mystery of life, the people you've placed in our lives, so that this Thanksgiving might be a time of enrichment for ourselves and those around us, Help us in a special way to both listen and reach out in helping people uh, who, who live with a disability and those who are caregivers. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Good night.